Good morning, everybody. Please take a seat. I'm thrilled to open now for the 23rd time the Common Core of European Private Law Project General Plenary Session. Uh, for those of you who are here for the first time, this is a project that was launched back in 1993 at the University of Trento, um, building on the shoulder of one that is considered perhaps the most important comparative law scholar that was active in the United States in the first half of the last century, which is uh, Professor Rudolf Schlesinger, who actually in uh, 1960 convened at Cornell a seminar on formation of contracts, inaugurating the so-called factual approach to comparative, to comparative law, that then in, uh, here in Trento and in Torino we've been trying to apply to a variety of areas, producing a large number of, uh, of books, of reports, and uh, that are then published every so, uh, so often by, Harvard, uh, by, by Cambridge University Press. Um, this plenary is, uh, the, the, the topic of this plenary session is law, science, and technology. And we have uh, an exceptional speaker, uh, Professor Yokai Bankler. But before introducing him, let me dedicate this morning for the first uh, of our international dedication to Professor Stefano Rodotà. Uh, Stefano Rodotà was uh, a great master of civil law. Uh, was a, a very special mentor to me and to many of us. And uh, he was the one who actually is responsible for having made the commons a legal category and a legal institution in Italian law. And after that, uh, and after that uh, pretty much throughout the debate on the commons Europe-wide. Uh, he passed away just two weeks ago, exactly two weeks ago, quite suddenly. And uh, he was actually one of the pioneers in many areas including the area of law, science, and technology. Stefano started writing in the early 70s about the law of uh, computers. Uh, and uh, he'd been uh, an associate member of the Center for Law and the Internet also here in Torino, the one who is chaired by Juan Carlos De Martin. And he has been uh, the founder of the Italian Agency for Privacy, uh, who actually inaugurated a long time ago and was really a towering figure in, in, in Italian law and in the Italian political, uh, political sphere. Uh, to me, it uh, was ter terribly sad. I had before experienced other losses of mentors, but this one was uh, particularly, particularly heavy on me, and I wanted to share with you a thought of Stefano. Uh, he was also a speaker here at the Common Core a few years ago, so he was really part one of us. Now, coming to our, the, the, the topic of this morning, we couldn't imagine to have uh, someone that could interpret better the spirit of this, uh, of this plenary than Professor Yokai Benkler. Uh, professor Yokai Benkler is uh, a professor of law, a distinguished professor of law at Harvard University, holding the Berkman Chair of uh, Active Legal uh, Theory or something like that. And, uh, and also has, uh, is a co-director of the Berkman Center, which is one of the major centers for the study of internet and society uh, uh, worldwide. Uh, he was a professor at uh, Yale Law School, at uh, New York University Law School. Uh, he was uh, a, the author, he's the author of a book that is a classic in the field, which is called The Wealth of Networks. It was published by Yale University Press uh, in 2000, 2006, broadly translated worldwide. In Italian, it came out, I think, from the University of Bocconi Press uh, a few years ago. Um, Professor Bankler has been an extremely recognized scholar in this field, which is a field that is actually an extremely recognized field. Uh, everybody who is actually interested in uh, law in the making and it was is happening around us 
and in the transformation of capitalism and how law reflects the transformation of capitalism is today interested to the issue of network and uh, the issues of uh, uh, the collective production of goods, the so-called sharing economy in all its variety of forms. Jokai Benkler has been a pioneer in studying that uh, and uh, in producing a variety of ideas and putting together a large number of fields of scholarship uh, to uh, the legal field in order to address the issues of the cooperative, the cooperative production. Uh, he was recognized many, many prizes, the most uh, recent and probably the most prestigious one but I, that I, I don't venture is the Ford Foundation Prize that he got in 2011 for visionary uh, scholars, major, a major prize in the, in, 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 in the United States and uh, he's been lecturing worldwide uh, a lot and, uh, and, and, and we've been very, very lucky to get uh, him here today with us. I had prepared a few thoughts but maybe I would like to leave those for the discussion uh, and uh, I would like to have uh, Jokai Benkler today, uh, he knows that the, at the International University College in Torino we are very much in the business of studying the commons and, so, and, the, and the access as a legal category trying to build uh, some legal notion and some legal structure about this idea of access that so far is very under theorized practically everywhere and so he decided to give us a talk on uh, commons and access and uh, the talk uh, is, uh, on the in is, uh, is online you probably are familiar with it by now with, because you should have read it and the floor is to Professor Bankler. Thank you very much, Yokai, for being with us. Thank you. So thanks, thanks very much, Hugo, for that very generous introduction. And, and uh, the remembrance uh, is a very special one. Uh, um, uh, I, uh, uh, I'm, I'm particularly thrilled to be here because of your work on the Commons and because of the central voice uh, you've offered, as I'll suggest and connect with the other schools, um, and, and try to create that conversation across. And I take it at least some of you have read the chapter from the Oxford uh, Handbook of Law and Economics, which focuses primarily on internal economics explanations. And part of what I'm going to try to do is connect that to uh, the effort to create a reconstructive economics in response to the 40 years of neoliberal transformation. So that's the primary goal. Um, the impetus is political. <laughs> this is, to my mind, the face of the crisis of democratic capitalism, a fundamental across the board rejection of the core established uh, uh, political economic system that prevails uh, and that has uh, suffered significant uh, disruption since uh, the Great Recession. Some of it certainly is about rejection of pluralism and cosmopolitanism and uh, removal of national and national identity as a core legitimate source of solidarity. But the greatest political successes have come in the two bastions of neoliberalism of those that passed the Reagan and Thatcher revolution, which if you see here from the Piketty and Says school, uh, this particular uh, 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 graphic shows the um, um, uh, two countries that have had the highest increase in top 1% uh, share of national income pre-tax and the largest decrease in top marginal tax rate, essentially underwriting the emergence of oligarchy. And if you try to look at the politics and ideology over time and graph it using the share of income of the top 1% as opposed to the 90 to 95th and 95th to 99th, what you see obviously is, a, is fairly flat going on, on even up to the 95th, very growth, small growth 95th, and a, massive increase in the top 1%. What you see very clearly is that the area of low and stable share trans, uh, traverses both Republican and Democratic administration, both conservative and labor governments in the post-war era. And uh, by contrast, you see the increase happening throughout initially the Reagan-Thatcher era, and then Clinton, Blair, Bush, Brown, etc. So it is perhaps 
So what's happened here is an ideological change in the Gramscian sense of a hegemonic ideology. What was politically debated became expert knowledge. And everyone had to follow expert knowledge. It's not therefore surprising that the winners in the money primary were not the ultimate winners in the election in the United States. And let's not forget that Donald Trump took over the Republican Party from the Republicans in favor of an economic nationalism that was fundamentally <coughs> opposed to the core of the Reagan Revolution, no less than before he beat uh, uh, Hillary Clinton. So what we're seeing is a combination of, on one hand, this is another way about the 1%. This is from says 95% of the increase in income between 2009 and 2012 went to the top 1% in the US. Uh, no less critically, from 73 on, you have a complete flattening of median compensation uh, with no growth. And most importantly, in the post-war era, productivity growth and income growth are very tightly correlated. And they separate out at 73, uh, which suggests a lot. And I won't talk about this in this talk, but this is much of my current project, is trying to understand what happened in the 70s and the 80s that really preceded the rise of neoliberalism. Because the inflection point, the inflection point for the top 1% is very much 1980, but the inflection point for median income is 1973. And trying to understand what's going on there is important. Perhaps most tragic is what we see here from Case and Deaton, which is that the uh, uh, American white, uh, white American longevity from 40, between ages 45 and 55 is the only Western country to see a decline in longevity, an increase in all cause mortality rates. All of it explained by, non, by high school and less educated white working class primarily dying of suicide Opioid, over, uh, uh, opioid addiction and uh, cirrhosis from alcoholism. People are dying of despair at a level that on a population-wide basis shows the only developed country increase in all-cause mortality for midlife uh, uh, people. It's therefore perhaps not surprising that in these two economies we've also seen remarkable successes for uh, old socialists. And the question then becomes, what is the answer that is not nostalgic, that is a move forward? And it's there that I see the role of the commons as an idea and as a set of practices as absolutely central. So digging into the idea, thinking of core pillars of neoliberalism. The first, really central in Hayek, is uncertainty and complexity mean that economic planning is impossible. The only way to achieve decentralized, coordinated behavior is through prices in markets. And that's what then underwrites the practical programmatic focus on deregulation, on financialization, on tax cuts, on lower inflation, trumping lower unemployment as monetary policy. All of these reflect the fact that it is practically impossible to manage as complex and uncertain a process of the economy. The only way to do this is through decentralized adjustment of distributed behavior. And the only way to achieve that for people such as us is through mutually adjusted behavior in response to prices in the markets. Get out of the way of prices in markets. Clarify property and contract law to assure the most efficient markets. And then you will be able to deal with uncertainty and complexity. This is also based on a view of the individual as acting with self-interest with guile, the model of rationality as self-interest, which then underlies some of the most, most important institutional changes that underwrote the rise of the oligarchy or the 1%, stock options, shareholder value versus stakeholders, fundamental transformations in managerial policy, managerial practice, in securities laws, in, um, uh, but primarily in social norms around the idea of assuring that an organization, an economy made up of individuals acting rationally in pursuit of their material self-interest under self-interest with guile 
will coordinate around prices to improve the general welfare. Another major school within neoliberalism, uh, uh, Stigler, etc., collective and Mansour, also collective action fails. Again, this is the limitation of the possibility of politics controlling the economy. Collective action fails. It corrupts into the Ill illegitimate, illegitimate regular power and therefore driving deregulation. In order to achieve a well-ordered economy through command and control, you have to constrain choice, otherwise you get too much complexity, and therefore liberty depends on choice in markets. And property rights and market incentives out of both of these are both necessary and critically here adequate to achieve both human welfare and human freedom. What I want to propose to you now is that the three schools of the commons, rather than the two that I wrote about in, in the, in the uh, uh, paper I distributed, or the chapter I distributed, uh, are the core idea that allows us to move back from these pillars, reverse them without falling back on a nostalgia to a state-centric, bureaucratically managed uh, economy. So <clears throat> primarily, I'm going to focus on two schools, on the Austrian school, of the commons and on the work that has come out from the enormous creativity uh, um, uh, of online practice that has allowed people as a practical matter to build core components of internet infrastructure on commons-based and collaborative uh, models. Things that run as opposed to things that work in theory one way or the other. There's a classic statement by Gareth Owen on Wikipedia, Wikipedia, the trouble with Wikipedia is it only works in, in practice? In theory, it's a total bloody disaster. Uh, well, um, let me tell you, in theory, it works too. And this is what I'm going to try to tell you. So let me talk about the three schools of the commons. Uh, the most famous, I'd say, today, and the most widely uh, 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 accepted and, and celebrated within economics with Lynn Ostrom's uh, Nobel Prize is the, the common property uh, regimes, the idea of common property regimes, the framework of institutional analysis and development. Um, it's primarily, and I'll go into the details of, uh, in a minute, primarily focused on local knowledge and effective self-governance and is primarily an answer to uh, the logical collective action. The second is the information commons or open access. This is a combination, as I'll suggest to you, and this is what connects it specifically to the technology of the moment. Two things. First, the rate of change, increased uncertainty and complexity of interactions to a point that got us where comments, and I'll explain why in a minute, were vastly more innovative and productive than property-based systems. And the second is that network technologies allowed people to engage in other in practices that we have always engaged in with each other as social beings. What was the news? Did you hear something about what happened yesterday? The kinds of things, telling each other the news, explaining to each other, teaching each other, that are normal to social activity but were peripheral to the economy. Because of the ease of communication, moved from being peripheral to the economy and central to the social to being central to the social as well. Critically here, this is growth-oriented, if you start with Carol Rose's work on roads and navigable waterways, but also information and innovation for infrastructure. Uh, and unlike the CPR school, not at the periphery of complex modern economies, but at the very core. The third school, very much the one that, that Rodota was, was, was central to, that your work uh, here is so central to, I, I see as the anti-commodification Commons, which goes to the question of shared ownership over critical resources aimed to provision enough of the necessities of life under shared governance to overcome capitalist social relations, if you want to think of it in the, in the Ellen Wood sense of market as imperative as opposed to market as choice. What you're looking for is a shared set of resources sufficiently available for access on terms of social participation rather than commodity exchange, to change the degree of dependence on selling labor in markets and change the, the power relations 
So first, just to, to, to clarify, the, if we try to understand property, it has to be in relation to resources. It's about power over resources and the utilization of resources. Um, so the resources that are most central to open commons are non-rival or partially congestible, whereas for common pool resources, they're subtractable or rival. Uh, pastures, uh, um, irrigation, uh, uh, canals, etc. Um, they involve society-wide externalities as opposed to being susceptible to locally internalized benefits. Again, imagine a pasture that is shared by a village, but if everybody from all over the world comes in, uh, uh, they don't. The externalities are local and internalized to the local community as opposed to something like knowledge. Uh, they are highly flexible and adaptive to change circumstances, whereas common property regimes are usually carefully tailored for well-defined and relatively stable conditions. They engage local knowledge for relatively stable conditions as opposed to allowing rapid exploration and change. Um, and they are particularly valuable for diverse uses and users as opposed to working best with similar users and similar uses. So they refer to fundamentally different resources with fundamentally different economic characteristics. And as a result, you also see them in very different ways. So critical roads, waterways, the public domain, um, as opposed to irrigation districts and pastures. If you're talking about complex modern economies, core rather than for periphery. These challenge the property-centric view of market society. In other words, the absence of exclusive rights, even at something like common carriage, is the central defining feature of open access commons, as opposed to a challenge to the logic of collective action, uh, which has to do with the absence of the state as opposed to the absence of exclusive rights, because they actually depend on there being exclusive rights to the common property regime and then internal division. <coughs> Their defining institutional characteristic is symmetric freedom to operate. Privileges and immunities in the Hoffeldian sense are critical, as opposed to rights that are asymmetric, rights to exclude at the group level, and symmetric norms governing internal uh, allocation. Um, all of these together make open commons a much more foundational challenge to the core pillar of the neoliberal transformation of perfecting property and forcing everything into market transactions in order to achieve better welfare and better freedom uh, as simply a poor factual descriptions of the most advanced complex economy. Whereas the Ostrom School suggests very careful analysis of the failures of the claims of the logical collective uh, 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 action, but in a relatively economically peripheral context uh, that ch don't challenge the core of the claims. Um, <clears throat> So the critical connection in the piece that I gave you, and that was, I think, perhaps a, a, a quite, a, I hope, useful, uh, the, the, the technology is that open access commons, contrary to uh, uh, belief, are actually ubiquitous and absolutely necessary in modern economies. So Carol Rose's beautiful piece from 86, The Comedy of the Commons, really is the anchor of this school. And what she does there is she uses the standard law and economics move, or rather the standard 1970s law and economics move, which is a naive form of institutional economics that suggests that efficient institutions emerge over time, over inefficient institutions. She does that and says, well, let's look at some of the central pieces of infrastructure. We start by having privatized toll roads, but over the course of the 19th century, they become public. We start by having privatized canals, but over the course of the 19th century, we see navigable waters becoming uh, public, uh, becoming essentially uh, common property. So if you buy the naive institutional story of more efficient uh, institutions develop over time and meet how is it that you have a move from things that start out private and then through decentralized choice and, and through law become 
uh, uh, property. And she uses there a relatively uh, early, because network economics is only developed more or less at the same time, a relatively uh, early version of network economics to explain the positive externalities associated uh, with travel and trade. Um, <clears throat> But obviously, the most important thing is the public domain in knowledge. And the battles that we've had over the last 25 or 30 years uh, 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 over the centrality of the public domain, whether it's for innovation to patents, to copyright, to the very prospect of innovation, and the deep, deep drag on innovation created by excessively strong property-like rights, uh, uh, has been central. Um, <clears throat> I offer a few examples, uh, again, at the very core of the infrastructural changes of uh, 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 the network economy. Uh, wireless spectrum, I'll spend a few more words on, has been, in some sense, A, for me, the things I've been working on since 96, repeatedly as a core issue, uh, and I'll explain why they're particularly important. Uh, but essentially, you are not going to get Internet of Things, you're not going to get, get ubiquitous computing, and you can't even use the data we have on our devices without spectrum commons, much more important than spectrum property. TCP IP, the core internet protocol, is a commons in the technical sense of symmetric use privileges, and it beat out an alternative competing, more proprietary model, the synchronous transfer mode, that was supposed to precisely force transactions and enable priority of service. It was not adopted. The same thing is true for local area networks with Ethernet and Token Ring. Ethernet is a commons protocol. Token Ring was a proprietary protocol, a property protocol. Uh, and by property here, I don't mean proprietary and somebody owned it. In the sense, what it was trying to implement was exclusivity so as to allow bidding on data clearance slots. It was trying to implement a market in data clearing, just like ATM was for the open internet. Free and open source software versus proprietary software, Wikipedia versus Encarta, etc. Commons based peer production, these are better known, I, I think, to most of you. And obviously, the rise of open access publication and academic publishing. Um, uh, which, which has been a central uh, 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 backup uh, within, uh, uh, within uh, academia. Um, I give these, again, because I think it's critical for me to emphasize that Wikipedia, Wikipedia works in practice not only in theory. That is to say, and, and that it's not at the periphery but at the core. There's a steady argument about utopianism in the context of commons and cooperation that attempts to denigrate the centrality of commons. I think it is absolutely critical to understand that that is simply factually false. If we had a neoliberal ideal in technological development, we wouldn't have the internet we have we wouldn't have the ethernet we have. We wouldn't have the wireless uh, carriage that we have. We wouldn't have the roads that we have. We wouldn't have the marketplaces that we have in city squares. We would be at a standstill. Let me talk a little bit about, um, uh, about Spectrum Commons, uh, because it's, it's special and distinct from um, uh, the commons in, in the public domain in copyright and patents because it is clearly a rival resource. It's not non-rivalrous. It is rival. It is congestible. Uh, it raises all the claims about why you need property. It's also had an intellectual history where from the 20s until the 90s, it was the classic case of command and control regulation over a critical piece of infrastructure. Beginning in 1952, actually with Leo Herzl's piece, but let's talk 1959 and Ronald Coe's piece, some of you may have heard about this little known piece called The Problem of Social Cost. Um, a year earlier, the entire analytic argument of the problem of social cost was laid out in this piece called the Federal Communications Commission about why it is a mistake to think that the fact that spectrum is scarce means we should have command and control. 
means we should have regulated spectrum. Instead, what we need are perfect property rights in spectrum, and therefore market clearance of ownership. And the ensuing 30 years or, or 30 some years of debate uh, eventually result in the early 90s in a partial victory with the adoption of spectrum auctions, and at least as important of spectrum auctions of a renewal uh, of a renewal expectancy. That is to say, even after you've won an auction, you really get to keep it. And the third is essentially creating flexible spectrum use rights as opposed to one. So you get the allocation and the, and the distribution decisions being made by the person who is willing to pay for this. But exactly when spectrum property actually got converted into actual practical policy, <coughs> policy it had become technologically obsolete. Because, as it turns out, spectrum commons or symmetric privileges to deploy radio equipment in a way that shares spectrum on a first come, first serve or some other algorithm uh, that is not based on whoever pays gets the most, had already begun to emerge. There was nothing, there was no standard until 98. But there were early non-standard implementations. When I first presented this at Columbia in '96, the just recently uh, left chairman, uh, 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 chief economist of the FCC, had the response saying, "That's silly." But a couple of years later, Wi-Fi was developed, and uh, what you essentially saw when I did this study again five or six years ago is that when you look at most of the mission critical areas where wireless communications are a critical input, adoption of open access spectrum-based devices dominated these markets. So, so smart grid devices uh, primarily, instead of, instead of this small sliver of companies that were based actually on proprietary spectrum owned by telephone companies, Almost everything went based on either Wi-Fi or 900 megahertz in the US, 800 megahertz here, Spectrum Commons, where more agile companies that had greater ability to innovate around services using supposedly junk bands of Spectrum Commons moved and provided these services better than did the systems based on, on proprietary framework. The same was true for healthcare communications, not only with Wi-Fi, some of it Zigbee, Bluetooth, RFID. Then the same as it turns out is even true for mobile data, with projections of over twice the mobile data carriage going over Wi-Fi. And what you're seeing today with 5G is the carriers trying to make up an excuse for appropriating a decentralized infrastructure that essentially was built and learned by these companies in the commons, but by having 5G, they'll be able to appropriate at least some of it. But the whole architecture behind 5G is an, ar is an architecture that does not actually require proprietary framework because it's small cell. You can go into that if everybody is interested in technical details. What's critical for me to see, for you to see here, is that this goes to the core analytic pillar that is absolutely at the foundation of Hayek's argument, which is uncertainty and complexity do not require property and markets and price-based clearance. And the Ostrom School's version is that converting resources and uses into prices also loses information not only converting to bureaucratic command and control, and local institutions embedded in local practices that are sometimes hundreds of years old actually reflect the local knowledge much better than prices, let alone uh, uh, managerial command and control. And this was primarily a critique at Washington Consensus Development Policies trying to implement property-based markets in the developing world. What you see with information commons and innovation is that the public domain and commons-based exploration allows for diverse people using diverse resources to apply diverse knowledge and experiment. It's essentially an evolutionary model of learning, and property is the drag 
that prevents whoever wants to and whoever can over uh, 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 to experiment. One way of conceptualizing this, and this is from another paper if you're interested in it called Peer Production and Cooperation, is that if you imagine a three-dimensional space with uh, the product space, what shall we do going from predictable and well-defined to diverse, uncertain, and complex, uh, with the who knows what resource space, routine versus knowledge intensive, innovative with a lot of passive knowledge, and, resor and, and resources based on high concentrated capitalization versus either low capitalization or decentralized capital like PCs or cars or what have you, what you see is essentially trade-offs between well-defined incentives and much more diverse motivations because the more you know who you want and the more you know what they want, the easier it is to price the effort. The less you know, the harder it is to price. The more important appropriability is as opposed to freedom to operate, the more you focus on optimization as opposed to exploration and experimentation, the more the commons offers better properties as an institutional framework for exploration than property. Property is particularly good for managerial hierarchies and relatively simple markets going on down here. Whereas commons are better, you see it in Mertonian science, you see it in peer production, you see it in individual users, and we actually see in society a variety of practices, the town-gown relationship that Silicon Valley and Kendall Square and other excellence uh, are precisely mixing pools between commons-oriented production models of scientific knowledge production and market-oriented uh, production. And when you talk about the tension between VCs older firms and universities, precisely the tension across these diversity of motivations and the freedom to operate competing with appropriability. So the critical thing about this theory is that it's a theory of the commons as a source of collective innovation and growth. The second argument is that collective, or, is that collective action fails. That was the core topic of CPR studies and essentially offers a devastating refutation of Olson's logic of collective action. In fairly well-behaved governance models, they have sanctions, they have proceedings, they have stable social norms. The critical target of the Ostrom School is the lack of necessity of the state to impose these relatively well-behaved institutions. What we've been seeing now in the last, I'd say, seven or eight years as commons-based practices development, Wikipedia is obviously the most important example Many of the larger, uh, uh, like uh, um, uh, Linux kernel and Linux packages, uh, uh, create a lot of work on knowledge commons, on culturally constructed commons, on peer production governance, provide a rich new empirical foundation for studies. You can have whole, uh, there are now computer science uh, um, 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 streams in major conferences dedicated to Wikipedia governance or uh, a lot of the work in computer-supported cooperative work today is a detailed study of governance and motivational structure within collaborative frameworks online, like Wikipedia, having to do with essentially developing relatively anarchic models that coexist with well-behaved models. So if you take a Wikipedia rule like ignore all rules, it doesn't really fit with the Austrian school of well-behaved structures. If you talk about um, um, uh, Tink, there is no cabal as sort of a central defining feature of, of some of these online uh, governance models. There's a much more participatory and, and the idea of rough consensus and running code, which still runs the Internet Engineering Task Force, that's not quite voting, that clearly is anti-authoritarian in any structure of authority, uh, and yet reaches a, 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 a deep hands on continuous communication and negotiation around a set of shared values. It's a much more values-oriented and practice community with clear outputs uh, way of saying, we need to manage this to work well. We need to test whether it works well or not. And we're all roughly sharing enough of a shared sense of what needs to happen to be able to measure and come back. In terms of the nature of rationality, we see a series of transitions around the rise of commons, but also part of a much wider intellectual arc that's not related to the commons, that if you look at the 60s and 70s, 
in evolutionary biology, in political science, in management science, uh, in some organizational sociology, the organizational sociology is probably the first discipline to, to get out of this. You see a transition from more collective stories to more individualistic and rational stories. Beginning in the 90s, actually with organizational sociology in the late 80s, and through the 2000s, even where experimental economics starts to come on board with work like Ernst Fehr's work and Sam Bowles and Herb Gintis and others, you're seeing an intellectual arc across all of these disciplines moving from Homo economicus, self-interest with guile as a good model, to Homo socialis, or diverse pro-social motivations, not Homo reciprocans, just reciprocity, which still can be brought down to self-interest. From competition as the uniquely best model of atomistic co coordination, the idea of cheap talk, you can't really communicate, you need to design the system on the assumption that when people talk, they're just trying to manipulate each other to their own advantage, to cooperation that's socially embedded and actually discursive. From separable motivational vectors with the material dominating, that is to say, if you add money to an activity, like saying, Please donate blood and we'll give you an extra 50 bucks if you come. Two non-separable motivational vectors which say, actually, if you offer money for this, then people who want it for the money will come and people who want it for social uh, contributions will leave and they're non-separable. So there are a couple of, those of you who are interested in this, there are a couple of superb reviews that Sam Bowles co-authored and most recent is, is his book, The Moral Economy, talking about these. But it goes all the way back to Bruno Fry's Constitution of Naves from 97. What that means is not that there are no micro-foundational bases for analysis of human behavior. It's not a re rejection of micro and a shift purely to structural or macro. It's not a rejection of agency. But it does mean that micro-foundational analysis needs to operate on socialized individuals, not on pre-social moments. That is to say, we have a diversity of needs, goals, social dynamics, and meeting. Sure, we care about material interests, but we also have moral commitments. We also have emotional needs. We also have social motivations, some of which are functional, which you see in the social capital literature some of which are conformist and behavioral, as you see with social network effects, and some of it are emotional connections and solidarity based. The situation or the frame is absolutely central to decision making and action at the micro level. And the potential misalignment of motivations means that when you do something, let's clarify property rights in X, you're going to confound social relations around X. Because that which used to be done for love is now done for money. And those two change the dynamics dramatically. And so you do have micro-foundational actions in the short to intermediate term, but they are socialized. And so they can be different across different societies in ways that are measurable. And the more that you now see experimental work, for example, on pro-social behavior across countries and classes, the more you see that on average people behave differently in different places in a way that correlates, for example, with human value surveys and things like that. The schools of the commons also challenge the property-based incentives being perfect and sufficient. Uh, Washington consensus development interventions we've already talked about in the context of uncertainty and complexity, just showing that they actually fail. Uh, with information commons, what we see is the claim that property systematically misallocates resources uh, and undermines follow-on innovation, and that prices can crowd out volunteerism. So it's both the, the loss of social motivation and the misallocation of resources. What this tells us is that property, it doesn't mean property is always bad and terrible. It's an important tool in an institutional tool toolkit that can be used where and as appropriate, but is susceptible to overuse. Caution and empirical assessment without assuming benevolence needs to be the baseline position about where property operates and how it operates. Um, <clears throat> functionally, 
even though property rules are very different from one country to the other, the defining characteristic of property is the allocation of control over resources by assigning asymmetric power to control the disposition of the resource. By assigning that asymmetric power, property law is transaction forcing. By contrast, commons relations are re refer to the family of institutions that govern allocation and control over resources by opening use and access to the resource symmetrically. It doesn't mean anything goes. There can be rules. The critical point is that they're symmetric, which means they make possible non-transactional relations around the resources so governed, which allows for communication and social governance to be the norm, because no one can just say, pay me or else, um, and allows for a space for the development of social relations of production around production and distribution of needs and resources to, uh, that is independent of markets as the core social relation. And that, I think, is the strongest tie to the anti-commodification school uh, 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 of the commons. Uh, so we see it, for example, in creative commons and the menu of, of, of uh, um, uh, licenses. If you want, if you look at CC BY, Creative Commons BY, uh, which basically means you can use this as long as you give me attribution. It's mine. Doesn't necessarily mean it's for sale. Anyone can use it. But the fact that I'm sharing doesn't mean I'm erasing myself. There can be a relation of social respect that is entirely independent of the commodity relation. Uh, CC non-commercial. There can be a robust system of social exchange independent of market exchange. You can exchange socially but not through the market. We can build our own commons. CC share alike, a robust institutionally instantiated practice of reciprocity. It's not only reciprocity, but certainly reciprocity is one of the modes. Uh, there can be CC by no derivatives. That is to say, you can read this, you can distribute it, but you can't create derivatives. It's not about collectivism. It's not what yours is ours. If the way you're sharing is about choice and self ownership, that's also still within the commons, diversity of commons. And it can be in the public domain. Creativity, freedom of speech and thought, depending on a robust public domain, as a claim, yes, this is part of all of us. But the diversity of institutional frameworks, reflecting a diversity of ways of interacting with each other as social beings, rather than through commodity exchange. From an economic perspective, we can see that commons improves on property under three primary conditions. First is when there are strong positive spillovers. This just goes straight to, to uh, uh, welfare. Education, health, trade, knowledge, and infrastructure are critical components of any advanced modern economy that depend, that have massive spillovers, and therefore uh, um, uh, would improve with commons. Uh, exploration and exploitation under uncertainty go to innovation and growth. This I already spent a good bit of time on when I talked about uh, uh, the trade-offs, the public domain, internet protocol, wireless, free, libre, open source software. And where social values are not translatable into prices. So an educated and informed citizenry, sociality in the public sphere, in public sphere, solidarity based on shared cultural experiences, all of these are social values that if you were to try to say, let's translate this into a commodity price, you simply couldn't. And so you systematically undervalue those whenever you're trying to uh, measure um, uh, and reflect. As a practical matter, and obviously I won't go into the details uh, uh, of all of this, as a practical matter, uh, when we actually try to look at the way in which we provision various goods and services in society, we find systematically that we have all four of these provisioning systems alongside each other. The state, markets, either through direct or indirect appropriation, social, labor, goods, donations, third sector, and nonprofits in nature. And governance, we have state regulation, property and contract, social cultural norms, or no constraint whatsoever. And you can begin to fill all of these models in ways that either use a symmetric strategy in the grain or an asymmetric strategy 
in uh, the light of uh, models. What's critical in terms of understanding the centrality of commons to modern economies is looking at something like this. Highways, public utilities, water, mass transit are all state tax or bond funded provision and state regulated, but fundamentally symmetric access and therefore a species of commons because they do not require a commodity relationship. Uh, they require a political relationship as their core driving uh, utility. Uh, the other thing that we see is common carriers, public, privatized public utilities um, are also, in some sense, the most controversial, or I'm, less, I'm least confident about putting these in the commons. Uh, but I think that, for example, the fact that we don't have, when there are power surges, we don't have bidding to allow some people who have more money to get the flow, but rather rolling brownouts suggests some either very strong social political constraint or uh, 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 that's from my primary uh, uh, theory. But the things that are the most exotic and interesting things that we've seen online that have been absolutely central are happening here. When you see social labor and goods, donations, etc. You see free and open source software by commercial companies. You see uh, uh, user innovation on the Eric von Hippel moment, much of commons-based peer production, TCP, IP, the web. This, for a variety of reasons having to do with the fact that capital has been widely distributed and innovation has been central, has actually made that outer rim of commons be absolutely central in the last 15, 20 years, filling out uh, these areas. Um, <coughs> Don't have my clock. How is this important? I should finish. I should finish. That's all. I have an ocean of time. Uh, I was originally supposed to speak for 45. So, so, uh, uh, and I heard, I saw one no, and as soon as I see people nodding off, I promise I'll stop. Um, uh, so clearly, hot dogs, homes, personal computers, IP goods, and coverage continue to be a very important component of the story. And the critical thing is to see institutional diversity in the actual practices. And that means adjustment between them and avoiding an ideologically driven, not experimentally and observationally validated, empirically validated assumption in favor of property misses the actual diversity of functioning economies. And a research project that looks, and again, this at least connecting to some extent to the question of, of, of comparative. It's easy to write an abstract model in economics that will tell you what's efficient and not. When you imagine binaries, property versus state, market versus state, market versus company. When you see the actual richness and diversity, even within the most market-oriented economies, you need much richer empirical research and much greater comparative uh, uh, perspective to see how these different systems are deployed, regulated, institutionalized, and practiced in different societies in order to extract the alternative from the practice to the theory, rather than going from the theory and imposing semi-blindness on the practice and then forcing the practice into a more market-oriented way. Because what we essentially see in the emphasis on property in the neoliberal moment has been an abstract model forcing reality through institutional changes to fit to the abstract model. Ironically, it is essentially the command and control approach that Hayek was so critical of applied to pushing everything into commodity relations and <laughs> Political theory. Um, very strong in the information commons and innovation framework. Free as in free speech is tied to skepticism of the proprietary model, which was the sort, the core claim that Richard Stallman made around free software. Not free as in free beer, free as in free speech. Um, there's a recognition within the space of network society 
that monopoly incumbent industries play a large role that's inconsistent with free, uh, with pure free market ideology. Um, it allows us a resistance to the idea of planned economy versus free markets. Instead, what we see is voluntaristic self-organization actually playing a significant role. Um, and it's tied in interesting ways to strong affirmative autonomy type claims. The idea of freedom to tinker, the idea that I should be able to see the basic pro software program running my car or my refrigerator. A sense of autonomy and self-creation is quite closely tied to many of these uh, views. Um, less in the Austrian Commons work and much more in both the anti-commodification and environmental commons framework is the insistence that free markets lead to a tragedy of the global, of the global co uh, uh, commons absent some form of a governance system and a sense of a shared stewardship that does connect to the Austrian Commons work on a more local basis at the global level. Uh, provides an alternative ethical framework rather than an alternative descriptive framework. So it's this connection between the idea of freedom as a political act and the idea of freedom from markets, not only freedom of markets, that allows Wikipedia to shut down in the process of an American debate over a new and extended property uh, uh, law proposed a few years ago in the form of the Stop Online Privacy uh, Act and, and uh, uh, PIPA, um, where the connection is so clear around imagine a world without free knowledge as the reasons we're shutting down Wikipedia in protest of a law that would excessively propertize information and undermine freedom uh, to operate. So, the commons as idea, at a mid-level, people can effectively act collectively to govern their utilization of resources. We respond to diverse motivations, economic utility, yes, but also a range of social, emotional, and rational ethical commitments. Property and markets versus state planning do not exhaust the means of achieving growth and material well-being. Voluntaristic action in commons can also support growth, be more efficient, and be more sustainable. At a higher level of abstraction, and this I think is the most important, social embeddedness is not something from which we need to free markets. Freedom is effective self-governance, both individual and collective. Property-based markets can undermine freedom in both of these senses by forcing a majority of people into relations where they are controlled by their lack of property, controlled by their lack of access to the means of, of uh, making a living. Uh, where markets disembed production, they can harm both productivity and freedom. And commons offer the institutional foundation of socially embedded production and distribution. Um, <clears throat> let me locate this a little bit in an intellectual history of the 20th century. Um, Think of property as a social relation, asymmetric power over resources. And the core feature of the emergence of social democracy across Western Europe and North America after World War II was a transition to a solidaristic form anchored in authority of expertise, in authority of the state, in patriarchal authority very often in many families, in sovereignty, and in assurance of the core needs through unions and associations rather than through individuals. The core project of neoliberalism was to disembed markets from this newly re-embedded social obligation. And you saw that running across a, a, a wide range of domains. And it was a project of neoliberalism, but in important ways it was also a project of the new left. Because the same authority structures that we saw in the context of managerialism and Taylorism also reflected the continuation of patriarchal relations in the family, in the US very much of, of, of racial uh, domination, and uh, the anti-establishment movement of the students of the 60s, the women's rights movement, the civil rights movement, rejected and forced us today to continue to reject a nostalgia to a post-war solidaristic moment that also included these sources of authority. What the commons offers us is a socially embedded model of production 
that doesn't actually depend on a reassertion of power by the state or incumbent social institutions. It's much looser networks that can be much more egalitarian and participatory in the practice as we see them than was the case in the more authority-based uh, structures uh, that reflected the post-war period. So limits and tensions. Uh, does mutualism scale? I don't know, we don't try it, Owen tried it, it didn't work the first time around. Uh, I think no one should be starry-eyed about the possibility of mutualism and self-governing uh, uh, communities actually taking over large parts of the, pop of, of the economy as an obvious answer. On the other hand, I think we're seeing a tremendous surge in interest in cooperativism. Uh, the platform cooperativism movement, open cooperativism, peer cooperativism, real efforts to say, look, if we were able to build a Wikipedia, if we were able to build a Linux kernel, uh, uh, we should in principle be able to produce a driver-owned Uber rather than an investor-owned Uber. We should in principle be able uh, to produce cooperatives that are much, that are able to scale and function. But that remains a real question for study and seeing what works and what doesn't work is really interesting. Within the state, and neither the Ostrom School nor the Information Commons uh, has a clear role for the state. Part of the effort that I'm making here to embed commons back into things that are already familiar to us in terms of state provisioning or state regulation is to recognize the fact that the core institutional relations and the core social relations that are enabled by commons are also present as important institutional components in state provision and state governed commons. And I think that's absolutely central. Um, what hybrid forms, what practical models can solve large scale problems better than either market or state models? I think one of the most interesting ideas still uh, is, is what the governing party of Barcelona today, Barcelona and Comú, is trying to do. Instead of public private partnerships, they're talking about private, uh, public commons partnerships. The effort to use state funding, in this case municipal funding and regulation, not necessarily to support a, a, a collaboration with private property-based systems, not necessarily only public and publicly controlled and publicly managed, but actually seeding and helping support commons-based practices where cooperatives and uh, uh, commons-based users and, and commoners share a set of resources um, uh, as a, a central economic model. Uh, how that scales to a higher scale, that's an interesting and complicated uh, problem. I think um, the European Parliament uh, report from a year, a, a week and a half ago on uh, uh, the platform economy or the sharing economy or the collaborative economy showed some interesting tensions between those parts of the Parliament that just wanted to get out of the way of Uber and Airbnb and those parts of the Parliament that basically said, we need to reconceive how unionization happens, how social protection happens, how labor regulation happens within this framework. Um, and the last is, is the market returning with a vengeance? This is back to the on-demand economy. Um, Uber, for all of the world sharing economy, is not. Uber is essentially a, a, a labor clearance market very much on the model of a spot labor, a spot market for labor. It relies on the same transaction cost economics of peer production in the sense that it's very low transaction cost, meaning that you don't have to do things inside a firm, you can do them in the market. But instead of enabling a social transactional framework, they're enabling a market transactional framework. Uh, five or six years ago, there was a lot of panic that everything and its cousin was going to become uh, Uberization of everything. I think it's a lot harder to imagine that that's in fact going in this way. It turns out most service relationships uh, aren't necessarily easily done on a, a quickie uh, a model uh, in the way that taxi rides uh, uh, can, but maybe delivery, maybe taxis, maybe one night rentals, we'll see how it all works out. Uh, but that's an incredibly rich area uh, uh, of study. Um, the other major threat is the rise of surveillance capitalism. The fact that essentially free of charge rather than actually free services are being given in relationship to collection of data, 
and its implementation through behavioral marketing to manipulate the behavior of large populations, whether by states in the context of politics or by companies. So again, how you maintain an open commons without becoming vulnerable to attack by major sources of concentration, be they states or companies, is another major, ch major challenge. So I'm not standing here to tell you to solve a problem that's all go and hang out in the commons together. What I am suggesting is that when you look at the intellectual trajectory of the last 40 years, the commons has become a repository of a set of epistemological claims about how we approach complexity and uncertainty, a set of uh, uh, observational claims about the nature of human interaction as being much more diverse, an obs a, a, an empirical and theoretical challenge, successful, I think in this case, completely successful challenge to the core institutional claims of uh, uh, the neoliberal project, and an opportunity space not for all of society moving away from property and market relations, but with a much wider scope of being able to move away from explaining everything in terms of commodity relations and being able to construct relations that are socially embedded through conversation, through collective, effective collective self-governance without falling back on traditional models of authority. So Wikipedia is in some sense a Rorschach test for everyone. Um, um, uh, for me, uh, that's the image and potential uh, that the Commons offers. Thanks so much, you okay? It was really a very, very fascinating lecture. Also, thank you for putting some thoughts about our own semi-peripheral fight for the commons that, you know, in, in Italy is going on very hardly in the lab and in Europe. We had some spillovers in Barcelona, and, but those are under-theorized practices, so it's extremely important to put them in the context of sophisticated theorization as you, as, as you did. So thanks really from the depth of my heart. Now, your, your official discussion is one half of the mountain doesn't need much of a presentation in Torino. He is a, a professor of uh, computer science uh, at the Politecnico. He, is a, he writes on La Repubblica and on La Stampa, which are two major Italian uh, national newspapers. And he is the founder and the director, co-director actually, of the Nexa Center for Law and Society here, here in Torino. So, Juan Carlos, thank you very much for being with us. You have the floor. Thank you, Hugo. It's my pleasure. Uh, it's a wonderful opportunity to discuss uh, the main important topics because the combination of the chapter plus the presentation makes uh, the overall um, contribution of, of Yochai Benkler really large and articulated. First of all, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a law professor, I'm not an economist. As um, Hugo said, I'm a computer engineer that has been naturally drawn uh, uh, almost inevitably drawn to the commons uh, by the very fact of being a computer engineer because um, uh, very seamlessly I was in, uh, attracted to the internet uh, when I was younger, uh, to free software and um, uh, my first uh, interest in law was participating in the trans-European movement against, against software patents which we could uh, think as a fight uh, to keep uh, an open access information commons about ideas implementable by computers and, um, and more recently, which means already 14 years, uh, the Creative Commons project that we, together with Mark Ricolfi, we, we brought to Italy and you saw also a slide about Creative Commons, uh, and then several years working uh, on the public domain uh, with a European project uh, incredibly named Comunia uh, about the digital public domain. Now, um, after all this, I have, uh, first of all, a set uh, Actually, just a few observations about the chapter, so that's the easy part. Just a few uh, pinpoint observations, and then a broader reaction to this um, fantastic uh, uh, contribution. Well, the pinpoint observation to the chapter are that, uh, unfortunately, computer science is not already won over by the open access movement. I wish it's actually far behind other disciplines. 
Uh, open access, just to be all, everybody on the same page, uh, means uh, free online access to scientific publications. And computer science is actually surprisingly uh, behind. Um, regarding open access, uh, and this is connected to something that will come later in my broader reaction, actually, I wish again that there was a, a, a spontaneous movement of researchers across the world pushing for open access. Actually, open access, uh, unfortunately, and I said that uh, with sadness, uh, has, worked, has worked when there was a top-down mandate. And uh, at least in Europe, I know Harvard is a different case, but in Europe uh, we had uh, essentially the funders, so the, people, the fund entities giving us money, forcing open access. And only in that case it really became widespread. And actually I recommend a wonderful paper by Jean-Claude Guidon, The Internet of Minds, that was recently published, that makes a very good uh, assessment uh, about the open access movement, the last 15 years, uh, what's the current state, what are the limits, why we were not, we were not successful as we thought it, it would be uh, 10 years ago. Uh, another uh, point, uh, uh, and I think it's the last one, uh, pinpoint observation regarding the chapter, which is already connected also to your presentation, is that when you talk about, uh, and I read from page 18, you talk about um, information gathered and processed by decentralized actors. Um, I, I suspect that uh, with uh, the so-called Internet of Things and the so-called smart cities, etc., so with widespread surveillance uh, also in the commons, be that the wireless commons, be that just walking on the streets uh, everywhere, so with the capture of data, that kind of data, and actually typically a capture by private actors, not everybody is lucky as uh, people in Barcelona, um, then we can uh, imagine something of almost pseudo-transactional again. I'm walking in the streets, but somebody is recording that I'm walking in the street, uh, and that data is uh, uh, stored uh, and then for later use. And so the, this uh, gathering of the Information gathered and processed by decentralized actors, uh, I'm afraid that this, uh, uh, it could change, let's put it like that. And um, connected with this is uh, what about data? Uh, when we talk about open access uh, information commons, uh, I think we should also talk more explicitly about data because data is undergoing uh, an incredible level of privatization. So there, is, there are entities, companies, and governments that are amassing a huge amount of data so which are not at all open access information commons and they have an increasing role in economic value, political terms, uh, all sorts of uh, potential uses. And so uh, I think we should uh, also explicitly think about uh, what do we do about uh, open access data commons specifically. Now that was the easy part. Uh, now, the more uh, ambitious but also more exciting part is about uh, reacting to the broader analysis uh, of Professor Bankler. Um, broader analysis, uh, also political analysis, uh, which is, uh, I think it's important to do. And uh, uh, if al allow me to go back uh, very quickly, uh, you also mentioned history, but let me go back to, uh, to the, after the First World War, uh, reading about um, contributions and 20s and, and even more so in the 30s, it was absolutely clear that uh, for a large part of intellectuals in Europe uh, and in the US, uh, liberalism was failed. Liberalism <coughs> was old. It's, it's, almost, it's almost fun to read these people that up to the 40s and 50s talking about liberalism as something of the 19th century, something that was, um, has no respectability anymore because that failed, that produced uh, through imperialism, nationalism, the First World War, and then it miserably failed with the Great Depression, and even more so with the Second World War. And so we have a, a generation, maybe two, that um, uh, for, for who, uh, whom it was obvious that liberalism had failed, and that it was important that the state had an important role. And uh, we see that very clearly in the, in, uh, in, with a cultural the reading of the Italian Constitution. Uh, if, we read, you know, if you read the, that uh, Federico Caffè, the great economist, participated in the, in the writing of some of the most important articles of Lelio Bass or many others that actually were pretty close to the heart of Stefano Rodotà, uh, we see that 
it, the Italian constitution and other post-World War II constitutions were very clearly um, a way of uh, uh, enshrining the, the wisdom of the failure of liberalism and the tragedy of the Second World War and fascism and Nazism. And, and so, and that was the basis for the glorious 30s where the state, so big state, big labor and, uh, and uh, big business uh, produced uh, the, that wonderful straight linear curve that you show of salaries and productivity going hand in hand. And they went hand in hand for a number of factors, but also because there was a big union and big state uh, clearly there. Now, that brings me to the, my main point, which you captured already in one of your last slides, uh, diminishing the, the force of all my criticism. Uh, which is, uh, in the, in over these 15 years talking about and participating also as, a, as an activist in the, in the Commons movement, uh, I increasingly um, interested, intellectually interested and politically interested in the role of the state. Uh, in the sense that uh, um, one key difference between traditional 19th century liberalism and uh, neoliberalism or ordo liberalism in Europe and uh, in Italy influenced Ger uh, in Germany influenced Italy is that uh, the, in neoliberalism the state is a fundamental role and so the capture of political power and the use of the force of the state in order to shape the market and shape it in certain ways and not others is crucial and therefore neoliberalism has explicitly uh, besides creating a cultural hegemony, and we, we would like to go back to that, but also explicitly created the political conditions to seize uh, political power and enforce, and we see it with Thatcher and Reagan, and we see it uh, all over Europe in the last uh, 40 years. Now, in this re regard, uh, that the Commons movement says uh, part of it, oh, we don't want the state, the state is, uh, is is bad and we want to, to do without the state. Um, I think it's politically very dangerous and uh, I think uh, we have actually a, a, an intellectual and political challenge which is uh, how to reassess the role of the state in a completely different landscape because it's not the 40s and the 50s anymore. The national and international landscape has completely changed. So we definitely have to learn from the criticism that you mentioned of the new left and others. We have to learn from that and we have to rethink the role of the state in a completely different scenario and also with a completely different uh, um, power relationship and also almost a different, uh, I mean, it's, uh, the generation after the Second World War had so clearly evident the consequences of the Great Depression and the war and that is gone so we have to rely on other, on other forces and it's starting to happen but not because uh, we have created an alternative hegemony, we are far from that, but because uh, we are seeing an increasing number of citizens that are, uh, they are suffering, they are actually suffering, and so especially young people, but not only young people, and they are, so because they are suffering, they are, and if they find the right political offer, like Bernie Sanders in the US, uh, Jeremy Corbyn in England, uh, Podemos in Spain, then they are ready to, quite, to, um, address and accept also quite radical proposals, which invariably include, uh, at least in the case of Sanders uh, and, uh, and Kirby, a very significant role for the state. And so we have to rethink that role and, uh, and getting closer to the, to the topic of the, the title of, of this talk also, how to incorporate uh, and maximize the commons within this reconceptualized state. And uh, I, I, far from having an answer or a proposal, but I see that as uh, both intellectually um, and uh, politically very important. And in this regard, and I go, come back to the chapter, and then uh, I, I leave it to the discussion. Coming back to the chapter, the chapter explores very carefully the, the, the interaction between uh, the Marx, Mark Rawlson position, let's call it, or neoliberal position, and the commons, so very carefully distinguishes the very different kinds. But I wonder about, uh, instead of doing something similar, with respect to the state. So looking more explicitly, also maybe simply reminding people of things that were very well known 40, 50 years ago, 
over what the state does well and what does not, how it could be improved. And so not only refuting and criticizing, as it's very well nice thing to do, it's an important thing to do, the property-based position, but also reclaiming and rethinking the relationship with the state. And I'll just make a very, very small example and then I can conclude. Um, thinking of saying the commons can capture local knowledge, fine. That's important. And a purely centralized uh, um, state-based model run by the capital doesn't capture local knowledge. But in Italy, for instance, we have a very strong tradition of municipal entities that were born typically, correct me if I'm wrong, in the 20s, um, local transportation companies, etc., that capture local knowledge. They're public, they're public. They're accountable to citizens through elections, through, although indirectly. Uh, but they do capture local knowledge. And so it's not uh, that this feature of the commons uh, is not uh, an exclusivity of the commons. It's also been done in other ways. And so also intellectually, going back to the chapter, it would be interesting to uh, learn more and think more about this other side of the interaction with the commons. Having said that, thank you so much, Yochai. Thank you for the invitation. Seems to me that there is uh, a the, the the word commons has been uh, successful, you know, and the success being witnessed for sure by the Nobel Prize awarded to Eleanor Ostrom, and the success of every idea produces very serious risks of appropriation and of depoliticization of the idea itself. Uh, and this is something that, uh, to me, is an extremely uh, important uh, issue to address. And uh, because I, I, I regard uh, the work on the commons in a way uh, on these two different poles. You know, there are those that work on the commons with an idea of uh, subversion of capitalism, and those that work on the commons with an idea of supplementing uh, the uh, liberal democratic organization with uh, uh, some other tool that works uh, better from a certain perspective. Now, your internal analysis uh, of this morning uh, was to me extremely interesting because it was based on uh, uh, not so much on the world of material things, not so much on the furniture of the world, but on the infosphere. On, the, on, on what is uh, out there in the information technology, which, which is mediated by technology, however. And, and, and it seems to me that a lot of the questions that should be addressed is how much the amount of knowledge that we learn by studying the commons in the infosphere can be translated into the study of the commons in, in the material space. Uh, there is some part of your paper that addresses, uh, that, addresses that, but it's very kind of short uh, and, and, and quick. You say, you, you refer to the work of some guy that says, well, be, be careful, but you don't develop your own uh, thoughts on this. Which uh, I would be very interesting to know, because here, when, when we study uh, private law and, and, uh, and the private laws of different European, European countries, we are stuck in a mental framework in which there is no space for the commons as a legal category. We have property, torts, contracts, they all assume private appropriation of, 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 of material spaces in order to build the system of private law. And the system of private law relationships is actually what uh, is the framework of uh, the capitalist organization, right? So if you try to introduce and to understand the notion of the commons that becomes as strong and as robust as the notion of property, or as the notion of tort, or as the notion of contract, that notion of commons is actually either something that becomes a subcategory of some kind, for example, of property law, uh, putting together maybe the limits to property law, giving some or it can become a different way to organize an entire private law system, right? Uh, 
because either it is an exception of a framework that is already existed, is the legal framework of, of the law, or it emerges as something that existed per perhaps before modernity, disappeared, and now is re-emerging from the strengths of the, of the information technology and the and cognitive capitalism. <laughs> So uh, I, I'm very curious to listen something about this question of translation of knowledge from the infosphere to the material world. Um, because the law is always falling, you know, is always running late. The, the transformation in the, in the technological world and the scientific advancements are very quick, very, very fast. You were talking about Encarta. I remember by Encarta from my daughter. 15 years ago, it looked very advanced. Now nobody even knows what Encarta was anymore. You know, it, it was just, it was just, but it was expensive. I remember, it costed like you know, 200 euros or something, and 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 it just became obsolete in a matter of no time or tonton or all that kind of stuff. And the law is just late. It takes time. Uh, so this uh, translation from the infosphere to the material and the, uh, and and the issue of the capacity of legal institutions to develop in a reasonable amount of time would be something I would really like to hear some of your thoughts on. But maybe we should open first for other questions, you get some of them, whatever you prefer to do. It's up to you, I can start answering two of you, or how do you want to Okay, why don't you uh, do a uh, shortly answer to the two of us, and then we will open so people have time to think about the questions they want to ask. Uh, these are big questions to have quick answers to. Um, um, so, uh, the most important, uh, the most important thing I, I, I want to acknowledge rather than have a full response to on the question of the role of the state is that what I've been doing with this paper and uh, with work that I'm working on now and with trying to study what's going on in Barcelona is precisely to recognize, and certainly it was much clearly, more clearly true of my work till seven, eight, nine, ten years ago than it is now, um, was that we saw the state as captured by um, incumbent industries and there was a in retrospect naive uh, belief that if the forces of the commons moved early enough to build a full infrastructure that was free and open source software that was open standards based that was open data based um, <coughs> we would win we would essentially build the world uh, in a way that would uh, that would uh, preserve freedom in the free speech sense into the system, and I agree with you that the uh, that the enormous political power of the incumbent industries and their creativity in actually creating new models of appropriation uh, forces us back into trying to understand the role of the state. Uh, and a lot of what you're seeing with what I'm doing now, of both trying to expand the idea of the commons to cover a lot of what we know is already public goods, and in terms of um, um, recognizing the threats from uh, surveillance capitalism and the threats from reappropriation, as you mentioned with the data, uh, has to do with recognizing that commons and mutualism are themselves also an imperfect system, no less than the state, no less than the market. And essentially what we need is an integrated systems approach. We need to be able to figure out where to locate which powers in order to counterbalance other powers. Um, <clears throat> I wish I had a more careful study uh, of where this works and how this works. Um, uh, but that's uh, 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 and as you saw towards the end of the talk, that's, that's to my mind the new, again, to the extent that there are PhD students here looking for really good projects, I think focusing on places where uh, state intervention and state structures can be uh, reoriented towards enabling and leveraging commons-based practices as opposed to optimizing privatized markets 
is a really important both empirical context and theoretical. As a practical matter, that then gets translated, as you said, into questions of subsidiarity and governance. So again, just a very narrow example. If you look at the European Parliament report on the platform economy from a week and a half ago, what the Transport and Hospitality Committee wants to do is basically take the neoliberal approach. Get out of the way, don't have local regulation, uh, what we need is just the technology, we need a European-wide unicorn to become some kind of global player, and therefore you want to get rid of all of these annoying local regulations so that you can have a single uh, market. That's the classic move of deploying state power to undermine potential local commons and create a single market in the name of growth. Um, by contrast, Claims from Catalonia and Barcelona, I just happened to be there last week, which is why I'm, 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 I'm raising that, uh, to say, no, there are very specific local conditions. If you look at hospitality, it's always local. The spillovers are always local. The culture and, and context is always local. If you look at transportation, it's always local. Uh, that's actually the appropriate locus is the municipality. And the political battles start to be at which level of government do you place authority based on your own sense of history of where power gets corrupted and where it doesn't. In the US we have a real problem with this because historically we saw progressive pushing for federal power because southern states and southern municipalities were imposing a, a uh, caste system, a violent caste system, and federalization was a liberating process. Now you suddenly see the same set of rules uh, being applied to municipalities that are trying to create a, a public uh, broadband or uh, uh, to municipalities trying to raise the minimum wage, you suddenly see the same uh, alternative being pulled away. And at which point, which leaves you essentially in a very specific and strategic battle over where to locate power. Hugo, we'll to your question on, on physical space and, and the infosphere. Um, Part of the reason that I tried to push towards focusing on roads and on infrastructure, I think Brett Frischman's book on infrastructure does a good job to go quite wide in this regard, um, <clears throat> is precisely to, to, to insist that it's not just about information. Part of the reason that I focus so much on spectrum is because from an economic perspective, it ha it, it's much more like um, uh, roads and squares than it is like uh, data. It's, congest it's congestible, it's, it's um, uh, renewable, etc. So, so those are some of the, at the theoretical level, some of what I'm trying to do. But how do you think about private homes in the context of zoning and rent regulation and Right? It, it takes an act of will, of intellectual will and political will, to say that the domain of private law of property includes some aspects of what governs our relationship to uh, the houses we occupy. But other things are municipal regulation or state regulation. They're not actually part of private law. And the, even the private law, public law distinction actually supports an illusion that these physical resources are fully governed by private law, and then there's a separate external thing called public law. But zoning is the clearest example where you basically say this is sort of outside of the private law thing and it's in relation to it as opposed to saying the set of institutions that determine my relationship with the place I live include things that are currently categorized under private law of property, under contract, under environmental regulation, under housing regulation, uh, under private public utility regulation with electricity and water, and in fact that's simply false. So that the idea is essentially to reject the coherence of the category and to try to see what are the entire set of institutions that govern the relations over uh, control and use of physical resources. And I think what we'll find there, and I'm, I'm ad-libbing now rather than having done the research, but I think this is a valuable research project, 
is to actually start to look at resource-based analyses rather than law-based analyses. See, what is the set of laws that governs the use and disposition of this resource? How much of that is really what we traditionally in the discipline will call private law and property? How much is public law? Um, um, and, and I suspect, just back of the envelope, that we'll find a much richer mix already as it is. Um, <clears throat> rate of change. Um, slow and corrupt. Michael Nilo from the University of uh, Utrecht, uh, the Netherlands. We should not fall back on traditions, I uh, have heard you say. We should make something new. We should reconstruct or construct commons. And I have heard Hugo's comments on uh, the common core of private law. It is not fit to encompass this new concept of commons. My question would be, is this really true? What if we would look more closely and more precisely to our common core? Would it be feasible, and I do think so, it is feasible, would it be feasible to see within our common cores of property and our property constructions concepts which very strongly, already since long, offer us constructions to encompass our new wanted commons. For instance, just an example. If I take a look at the institutional systematization in the early modern time, I very clearly see the qualification of various public commodities as things which are outside commerce. Now, this is a clear indication that in the institutionalization of private law, civil law, there is room, very clearly, for commons. If we are comparing these days, we tend to forget what we already have been including for ages. But we do not look so often beyond the civil law codifications, for instance. And that is, I think, something we may want to do a little bit more. Thank you so much. So I am Sara Shen Shen from uh, Studio Legale Tributario in Ernst Young, so I'm not an academic, um, but thank you very much for this great lecture and amazing opportunity to be here. Um, I have been invited by Professor Raineri and uh, I um, seize this opportunity to ask something which is more material maybe uh, for the discussion and for um, the, whole, um, the whole idea of open access. Um, I wonder whether, I have this question for Prof Professor Bankler, because I wonder whether in this scenario that you discussed today, um, there is still a p p the possibility to talk about liabilities and whether liabilities of the actors involved in this open, ac open access scenario, um, how they are allocated and uh, how they are distributed. In particular, I'm asking this because we, as a law firm, we are working for um, the European Commission evaluating a pretty much old uh, legislation, which is the Directive on Product Liability, which is actually dated 1985, so uh, quite old for uh, the new technologies uh, compared to this, let's say. And uh, the Commission is wondering whether the traditional rules on liability as, are still apt 
in particular compared to the Internet of Things, in particular compared to the increase of new technological developments, as we call them, because it's a pretty um, uh, heterogeneous, heterogeneous category. So I would just like to know whether, what's your impression about this and whether we can identify new regimes of liability in this regard. Thank you very much. Thank you. there's a question here. Oh, thank you very much. Is it working? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, just a theoretical question. Uh, I mean, as long as uh, Wikipedia is an ink blot test, we should think about <clears throat> Doesn't it really look like a perfect template of a high ex spontaneous order? It is a cosmos, it is not, certainly not a taxis, it is undesigned, it is displaying real novelty, depends, emerged out of trillions of individual decisions and programs. And indeed, it is true that Hayek is referring to the price system as an example of spontaneous order. It is just one among many. For instance, language is the perfect spontaneous order for Hayek, and it is not, it is not based on monetary expected returns or property of words or graphs. <coughs> so maybe you are right. Maybe if you are right, there is a big inconsistency within Hayek's theory of spontaneous order. Sure. Um, <clears throat> uh, okay. I, 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 I'm assuming not. Uh, uh, I, I don't assume a monopoly on that. Um, I think the risk of. I, I, I'm in some sense taking them out of order, but. Uh, the most direct question, I think, is uh, Hayek and Wikipedia. Um, yes, in theory, Hayek is about spontaneous order of any form, but I don't think you'll disagree that the entire programmatic punch is spontaneous order through a specific set of signals, which are prices. And I think one of the problems we've seen in the last, say, 30 years is that the markets have turned into a metaphor for decentralized behavior, um, which has disabled us from learning from the experience of non-market-based decentralized behavior to the, to the possibilities of successful, effective economic production and collective action that is not based on commodity relations. Part of what I'm trying to do now is actually say the core critique about the problem of command and control is probably valid at its core. The core translation to perfection of price, which you already see in Hayek, it's not as though Hayek is in fact all about decentralized uh, and then Milton Friedman comes along and makes it into markets. It's right there from the start. Uh, and it's a critique specific, as much of Keynesian economics as it is of, of anything else. And so I don't think you can ignore that. And, and to me, it's important to make sure that when we say markets, we stop using it as a metaphor for all kinds of decentralized behavior and start using it with its proper name, decentralized behavior that is cleared by prices, and start looking at decentralized behavior that is not cleared by prices as forms of social production, some of which are based in commons. Commons is an institutional framework, it's not a practice, but it's an institutional framework that allows for socially embedded decentralized behavior. So that's to me, at the moment, important. Um, <coughs> the question of, of uh, European civil law sources, I assume well, that's, that's more for you. I just remind you that, that um, it, uh, uh, Carol Rose, who very much worked in property and, and new Roman law quite uh, uh, well was focused on its relationship to the res commune and actually, uh, uh, and actually already went into that direction. Um, liability rules, uh, I'd say the closest analogy, the, 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 the most 
direct uh, relationship comes in the context of free and open source software, all of whose licenses explicitly say that it's on an as-is basis, precisely because liability rules can influence the capital cost of production of a different model. If you remember the three-dimensional space that I was talking about, and I talked about concentration of capital costs as one dimension, drawing you to the origin that was more proprietary, uh, liability rules, when designed without sensitivity to the mode of production, will create entry barriers to social production that will require sufficient capitalization to prevent the liability. One of the arguments early on in the internet against internet service provider liability for defamation and things like that was that precisely it would force concentration of control over the system and undermine the decentralized model. So to the extent that liability is the framework through which you're thinking, uh, my core argument would be that liability rules for commercial, traditional model producers would need to be different than liability within communities of practice. <coughs> Recognizing that you're essentially shifting the care from the producer in a classic commercial producer consumer model to uh, social network of providers uh, who have to engage essentially in a much more, in a much flatter relationship. Yeah. Um, just, just a remark on the, on, the, on the first of the questions. In 23 years of work in the common core uh, of private law, uh, we have learned one thing that a lot of the answers you get are determined by the questions you ask. Uh, so if you ask questions that are straight within the framework of property, contract, and tort, you're going to get answers that are straight in the framework of property, contract, and tort. Uh, if you want to try to... I perfectly agree with you that a lot of the institutions of the commons, actually I wish you were here yesterday when we had actually the discussion of the commons group, but a lot of the institutions that developed over time, after modernity, developed over and a, a, a layer of commons that were everywhere, okay? And they were progressively marginalized by the building of, you know, traditional code-based private law. You still find also in the code some remaining here and there. But they are always phrased as exceptions. It's always an exception to an organization of private law that is based on the notion of property as exclusion and is based on all the derivative notions of property such as I regard all the rest of private law that are based on the framework of exclusion. Okay? Institutions of the commons might be seen sometimes as exceptions here and there. So I think that it's very important to make uh, lawyers understand that the world is changing fast around them. That we can keep discussing the old good stuff, but the world is not anymore about the boundaries between the farms. Okay? There are economic institutions that are developing the infosphere, that are changing the world around us, including the collection of big data that put basic challenges to the very idea of private law. Okay? And so keeping in the track of looking at private law with the usual lenses is not just a conservative move, but it's just a way to marginalize lawyers from the center of the scene where the action happens. And I think the old, the old thing we need today, the current phase of capitalist transformation, the one that we least need is to have the law marginalized. Because if you have the law marginalized completely, we, you have the discussion on principles, the discussion of justice, the discussion of decency marginalized in favor of you know, extraction of value. Okay? This is why in the last two or three Common Core editions, we have tried to deploy the commons as a central category to look at the problems of private law inverting 
the perspective between the rule and the exception. Okay? To try to ask questions that will give us answers that are more interesting and more capable to do adapt to the current circumstances of capitalist transformation that the rules that are back there in the civil code of 1804 has changed over time, but that are based on an economic model that is completely different from the economic, the economic model of today. Okay? So if you ask questions of that, and then maybe you can get you know, a variety of institutions of the commons be developed in order to organize alternative classification that might be very important. There are entire notions that could, be, could emerge from you know, empirical observation of the law as it is, as much as possible, that we don't have, but that there might have centralized, central roles to play in the future development of private law. I think there's notions of, such as access, you know, notions of community. If there is one thing that is under-theorized in private law everywhere, is the notion of community. Yet, you know, if you look at the law from the perspective of, uh, you know, the transformations, these are ecosystems that are communal structures. They are all things that have to be looked, that cannot be looked anymore just with the mechanistic vision of individual private law. And this is why, you know, we are trying to push lawyers to think, to think in, that, in, in that direction. And this is why, you know, I'm very, very happy of the contribution of Yokai this morning. And if there is any one more question, uh, we might still have a minute. Actually, actually, we're out of time. But if there is someone who has an urgency to ask a question, please go ahead. <laughs> and if not, I'm happy to answer both questions. OK, the data question. I want to cut off something that's what looks like there is a question. Yes, please. There is a question here. Yes. Hi, I'm Giulia Priora, PhD student from Central European University. And just a very quick uh, question when Professor De Martin was also um, posing his comments. Um, within the framework of role of the state, it's a, again a quick but a literatical one. Um, since your paper put a lot of emphasis on positive externalities, to reverse a little bit the policy making or the role of the state as also your invitation towards us PhD students to take room into the political process or just the idea of the state uh, taking new ideas and going uh, more towards the commons. Should we look more on this kind of perspective to the externalities, like the positive externalities you're pointing out, or rather to the effects of some provisions? Should we apply, for example, I, my field is copyright regulation, um, should we apply the traditional model of reason, rule, and effect, or should we, in this postmodern world, apply more the vision of externalities being more important, the positive externalities as affecting more the social dimension, the negative externalities, that is actually also my point, having more and more importance over the effects of legal norms. So, uh, <clears throat> great question, and I will connect it to the question of data because data in this regard is, is very critical. Um, I want to emphasize that when I talked about positive externalities, I was describing one characteristic of some resources that makes commons particularly attractive for managing those resources when there are high positive externalities. I think there's no question that uh, commons also incorporate in uh, situations where there are high negative externalities. But if you think of uh, um, pollution, uh, we're treating essentially, uh, uh, we're treating the environment as a commons in the sense of an open access commons for purposes of exhalation of industrial waste. Um, and the whole battle over emissions regulation is a battle over uh, 
shifting the environment for purposes of, of, of industrial exhalation from a no constraint provisioned by nature. If you remember the four by four, there's the bottom right hand corner is provisioned by nature, no constraint. And we're trying to shift that into the upper left hand corner or into the bottom left hand corner, which is provisioned by nature and state regulation as a mode of uh, communication and tradable freight permits, but moving the, the, the slides. And that comes back to the question of data. So let's back up just to your question specifically. Um, <clears throat> I think externalities are one uh, dimension of considering effect, and that's how I would think of, of how to connect them. But I think it's important, uh, uh, at least in my view, to be thinking of the relationship between institutions and resources and practices, rather than necessarily about a legal area. So, what is the particular social practice that you're interested in in the context of copyright? What is the set of resources? Is it academic copyright? Is it popular culture? Is it popular culture or is it classics? W what is it that's the dynamic, which will have its own context of what the provisioning system looks like, what the allocation system looks like, what the externalities are, how it connects to other system, and having this kind of rich, historically and socially embedded understanding of how the law works uh, I think is the way to look at it. And positive and negative externalities is one such, one component of this. I, I don't think they can be the same or not, either one of them. Uh, but they need to be part of the story. But, but the point about data, which I also wanted to come back with, is exactly like the, Bruce Schneier talks about data as the pollution of the, in, of, of, of the information uh, 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 economy. Uh, in the sense that we're treating personal data in the way that we're treating the environment for purposes of industrial exhalation, and that the practices of capturing this data that you were talking about, processing it, embedding it into behavioral and experimental structures, is uh, imposing tremendous negative externalities by creating this surveillance system on the life of people and on their sense of autonomy and creating opportunities for extraction. And so one of the core challenges uh, around data is what does it mean <coughs> to create an appropriate regulatory framework for data capture and manipulation that will not just be privatization under asymmetric power in the sense of my data is mine and then there are just transactions in the way that we have privacy regulation today with notice and consent. Um, how do we create uh, data interoperability and data portability are real regulatory questions that are essentially about creating a data commons while preserving the individual autonomy uh, in privacy and I think that's one of the uh, I have not seen a single coherent top to bottom answer for how we do that. But to me, that's absolutely central. And what's happening now, back to the point about speed, the data practices are developing so quickly. And the fact that even though in theory, in the US in theory, data is in the public domain. There's no intellectual property right. Google has no intellectual property right in the data. What it has is physical control over it. And we don't have a public regulatory framework that will allow, that will require access to that data in a way that both respects the privacy of the subject and provides opportunity for everybody to use it. In this. this is an enormously complex design problem. It's not even half solved or a quarter solved, but I actually think that that's a place where essentially the fact that we are failing to recognize that property is developing in a practical way without any rules that constrain it one way or the other as a major source of power uh, needs to be responded to with some model that we use words today like open data and data portability and interoperability of data standards. We say those words, these are different words that are stand-ins for institutions that are commons in the sense of IETF type not, not, or net neutrality type commons, but that haven't actually been implemented in law at all. Well, thank you very much, you guys.
there is there is nice no some food that uh, is offered as a common out there and so uh, 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 let's exercise <laughs>